Welcome everyone to the first Thursday Refuge Recovery World Services class group. Uh, I'm Noah. Nice to see everybody. Thanks for joining me or for tuning in later on YouTube. Just a reminder, this is not a refuge recovery meeting. If you're looking for a refuge recovery meeting, uh, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> refuge recovery meetings are peer led. And um, this is an offering of world services that is teacher led. Um, so I'll be teaching the class and taking some questions and uh, connecting with the uh, community. Usually we um, kind of jump into a meditation and then have a talk and some discussion. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit um, before we meditate tonight, because we're going to do um, a meditation and reflection on uh, impermanence and death and reflection on uh, the corpse. And um, this teaching traditionally comes in um, in Buddhism, in the Buddha's Four Noble Truths, those of you who are familiar enough with the book will see that I, I wrote about um, the corpse meditation in the right. foundations of mindfulness. And I... Um, there you go. Yeah. And I... Um, I put a meditation on the corpse in the back of the book, the self-guided guided meditations, but then I never made a um, script for it. I wasn't sure about people doing it in meetings, um, but a volunteer, I think last year, did make a script for it. So there is a script for the um, corpse meditation on the website. Um, if people want to, I add that to the uh, practices in their meetings. So much of what we become aware of in Buddhist meditation, especially the mindfulness aspects of Buddhist meditation, is impermanence. The uh, transitory nature, the impermanent nature, the constantly changing nature of everything, even just the simple mindfulness of the breath that we begin with often in Buddhist practice, uh, teaches us that each breath has a beginning, a middle, and end. Each breath um, is different than the last, is impermanent. No, no, it's, it's repetitive. <laughs> we have to breathe over and over and over and over um, because it's all impermanent. And then we start to understand that that's true about everything. It's true about all of our emotions. It's true about all of our sensations. It's true about all of our uh, relationships on one level or another, all of our experiences on one level or another are everything's impermanent. And then in the first foundation, the Buddha says, now reflect that you yourself, your body, your uh, corporeal being, this, this physical form is also impermanent. And um, both as a uh, tool to understand impermanence on a greater level, as a um, way to appreciate the life that we have, the, the fact, you know, focus on death to appreciate that you're not dead yet <laughs> and the uh, urgency of um, kind of what we're doing, the practice, the healing, the recovery that we're engaged in. Um, and also partially this reflection on the corpse serves us to be less identified with our physical form, less attached to the body, and more maybe oriented towards our um, emotional and spiritual process of awakening and healing and not so material, not so focused on my body is who I am and I need to stay young forever and I need to look a certain way and all of that bullshit that uh, society puts on us and the mind, you know, takes on, you know. Um, 
So breaking our, our identification with the body. And I, I think ideally uh, a healthy, my, my own opinion is a healthy relationship to the body is understanding its impermanence and its impersonal, uh, not, not who we are, nature, um, but being a good custodian of our bodies, you know, kind of being like, you know, I've got a, I'm in this body, it carries around my karma, it carries around my, my, my mind and my memories and, uh, you know, my, my form in this lifetime. So I, I need to take care of the body, you know, and exercise it and feed it green vegetables and all of that stuff that we need to do uh, to have a healthy physical form while we're still here breathing. I do want to pause and just reflect that, um, you know, I, I have a sense and I wonder, just a rhetorical question for you to reflect on, feels to me like um, addiction almost killed me. And, um, and recovery is some level of a new incarnation, some level of, a, um, you know, having sort of escaped the, what felt like a pretty terminal situation in active addiction. And um, a lot of us, have, you know, watched a lot of people die around us and, uh, and then even when you come into recovery and you start to meet the recovery people, um, you'll see people relapse and die. And, um, you know, death is, I, I think maybe on some level, I'd imagine this might not be true for every single one of us, but it makes sense to me that actually addicts uh, have a bit more proximity to death in, in a lot of ways. We're closer to it a lot. It's... Um, than people that aren't, you know, recovering from addictions. Of course, there's also a lot of us that have um, suffered from, experienced a lot of suicidal thoughts and feelings, ideation, obsession with death, and death being um, not as scary as it is perhaps thought of as a, a, a relief of like, if it gets bad enough, I can get out. I know that was my early life's experience that I wasn't so afraid of death that actually death felt like um, it might be the only control that I have in this lifetime, the ability to take my own life. So each one of us has a different uh, relationship to death and to life and to the body, existence. There's a teaching that just occurred to me where the Buddha, they're called the five daily reflections that he encourages people to do, where he says, you know, each day uh, say to yourself, daily reflection, reflect on um, this body is subject to aging. And then say to yourself, I am not exempt from aging. This body, I uh, am subject to illness. And then reflect to yourself, I am not exempt from sickness and disease and injury, all of the different levels of illness. And say to yourself, uh, I am not exempt from death. The outcome of birth, the reality is that this body will be lifeless, will die. And remind yourself every day, I'm not exempt from, from death. Break the denial <laughs> about death and, and actually have a friendly relationship to it is the goal. And the, so, the, you know, sickness, aging, death. And then these two teachings on, um, one on impermanence and one on karma, where he says, uh, and reflect to yourself that everything that I cling to, everything that I love, everything that I hold dear to me, uh, will be lost. I don't get to keep any of my stuff. I don't get to keep any of my relationships, the truth of impermanence, the truth of death. Um, we don't get to keep any of it. And the final one, the fifth reflection, uh, which is that our only true possession, I'll be separated from everything that I cling to. And the only thing that I truly own in this lifetime are my actions, which is the term for karma. Karma, we own. 
<laughs> even death doesn't wipe the slate clean from a Buddhist perspective. We own our karma. Everything else just temporarily, um, temporary custodians of our stuff. We don't get to take any of that, don't really own any of that when, you know, when the end comes, when death uh, is experienced. But our karma, our actions, how we've been behaving, how we've been reacting, how we've been responding, we own that. And of course, you know, that's kind of good and bad news, karma, uh, Buddhist understanding of cause and effect. On one level, it's quite good news because it's saying you have the ability here in this lifetime to purify your karma, to change it so that actually, you know, at death you're done, you know, you're free. That's part of the teaching. You can uncover compassion and wisdom and, uh, and not have a whole bunch of negative karma with you at the, at the end of life. Um, so it's, a, it's very, from that perspective, it's a very empowering uh, understanding. I'll, um, you know, in our book on page 31, in the first chapter of the, or the fifth chapter, the, the first section of the Eightfold Path on understanding, um, three sections, understanding the impermanent, the uh, unsatisfactory, and the impersonal nature of all things. Uh, the book says halfway down page 31, one of the key things to understand is that everything is constantly changing, both inside and outside of us. Our very bodies are in a constant state of change. First we grow up, then we grow old, then we die, and our bodies continue to change and decay. On the physical level, this is obvious to most but mentally it can come as breaking news. All sensations, emotions, sounds, smells, tastes, sights, thoughts, feelings, moods, experiences, and relationships are impermanent. They all have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Nothing lasts, nothing is constant, nothing is permanent. Just the arising and passing of phenomena in the body. As we all found out as addicts, it's impossible to maintain a permanent state of intoxication. That was not our failure as addicts. It wasn't because we weren't smart enough or rich enough. It was because it's impossible to win the battle against impermanence. Of course, the fact that life is impermanent can also be good news. It can work to our advantage. This shit won't last forever. For instance, impermanence is primarily problematic when life is pleasurable. Even when we're enjoying ourselves, we still have to understand this shit won't last forever. If we live long enough, we will watch all our friends and family go through losses, illnesses, and difficulties, and eventually die. Many of us have already experienced tremendous amounts of loss at a young age. We live in a world of loss, of change, of constant instability. To recover, we must understand and accept impermanence. We must replace the reactive survival instinct of clinging, grasping, and attachment with the right, wise response of non-clinging, non-attachment, and compassion. In a world where everything is constantly being pulled beyond our grasp, clinging and grasping have always resulted in the rope burns and unnecessary suffering that accompanies it. So leading into the meditation, we're gonna do on death and a reflection on corpse and the body as a corpse. You can sit up for this meditation. You can also lay down, you can take the corpse pose if you want to, um, if you can do that without falling asleep. <laughs> um, so find a way to be that is coming into stillness. This lives on page 198 in our book. 
part five of the first foundation of mindfulness, corpse death meditation. Sitting or laying down in a comfortable place, allow your eyes to close and relax into the present time experience. Feel your breath as it comes and goes. So just spending a first couple of minutes, just being mindfulness of all of the signs of life in your body. Each breath, each heartbeat, notifying us that we're still alive, still breathing. As we do with mindfulness of the breath, if the attention wanders, just come back over and over to the sensations that are here now. Giving preference to the sensations that the breath creates, the nostrils, chest, belly. Bring awareness to the heaviness of the physical body, the pressure against the cushion or floor. Feel the effects of gravity on your body. See what happens when you soften any tension in your face, your jaw, allowing gravity to pull your shoulders towards the earth away from your ears. Maintaining just enough tension in the body to stay upright if you're sitting. Allowing the body to hang loosely around the skeleton. And begin to imagine or visualize your body as a corpse. See your body as motionless and inanimate. Acknowledge that this is the inevitable destiny of the body. And breathe in and out of the place of acceptance of death. If fear arises, just soften your belly to the fear. Allow it to be there. See the clinging, the craving for continued existence. 
maybe sadness or grief comes up. Tend to those emotions, don't push them away. Acceptance of death is our aspiration, but we don't start there. Training the heart and mind. This very counter instinctual meditation practice of turning towards our own impermanence. Now begin to see your body as having been dead for several days, bloated and beginning to rot. Imagine your body as lifeless and in an advanced stage of decomposition. Allow your imagination to be as graphic as you'd like, worms eating your flesh, maggots, and so on. These are the images that the Buddha used when encouraging reflection on the corpse. Reminding ourselves that we're not exempt. This very alive body will eventually be lifeless and decaying. The four elements returning to the four elements. Then move on to seeing your body as a skeleton. All of the flesh and blood gone. Bones and ligaments alone remaining. Even the bones are beginning to crumble, eventually falling apart and scattering until Finally, only dust remains. What is so very much alive and feeling solid and separate? So nature is to decompose, to scatter. might take months or even years before 
the elements that start to break down. But eventually this body would dissolve. Reflecting on the five remembrances, reflections, say to yourself, this body is not exempt from aging, subject to aging, saying to yourself, I'm not exempt, I'm continuing to age. Breathe that in with as much acceptance, awareness. Say to yourself in your own heart, this body's not, this, this body is subject front to illness, disease, injury. I'm not exempt from illness. And breathe it in. This body is subject to impermanence, to death, to decay. I am not exempt from death. Everything that I get attached to, everything that I cling to, that I think I own, that I want to keep, I'll be separated from. Again, if there's emotions that arise in these reflections, tend to them, accept them. sadness or fear, perhaps even the mind 
wants to reject the reality of what we're saying to ourselves. And the final recollection we say to ourselves, the only thing I truly own are my actions. I am born of my karma and I am the heir of my karma. Allowing the reflection to end and returning to mindfulness of your breath and body in the present, here. Feel life, each breath, reminding us still alive, still here. Each sensation, each emotion, each sound, sense door, experience. Still here, alive very much. reflecting on the preciousness, the opportunity that we have here to heal, to recover, to use our life's energy in positive ways to help each other. This meditation is meant to bring appreciation and preciousness to life. By acknowledging death and decay, we remember the importance of each moment of our existence, of being alive. When you're ready, you can allow your eyes to open. You can reincarnate, come back to life. Death is a big um, topic. Um, Our relationship to our own impermanence is the main focus of this meditation. But of course it can bring up all of the grief we have at having lost loved ones or friends or pets or whoever we're grieving about having lost. Living in this world of impermanence where um, loss is so common and part of what we're all dealing with. So I'd like to have some conversation with you. Does this feel um, useful to your recovery? I've found it pretty useful to mine and have had a a really gradual journey from um, suicidal thoughts and feelings that were very pervasive in my childhood and young adult years to um, more, a a little bit of a, um, I think in my early recovery, I was a bit ambivalent about surviving or not. So you might, you might still be in some suicidal feelings or you might be in some ambivalence. Um, It wasn't until pretty far along in my own process of healing and recovering that I started to actually 
um, really want to exist, <laughs> really, really feel connected to existence and to appreciate existence. And I feel like actually this meditation on death was part of what helped me take birth as a person and a responsible person and start to in, start to see that actually um, existing is not that bad. And then actually we can really help each other a lot. And all of the people who have helped me over the years and all of the people who I was able to um, help in, in whatever small ways. And um, you know, this whole thing, Buddhist perspective on karma and reincarnation really fucks up suicide. <laughs> because if reincarnation is true, how much does that suck? <laughs> How much does it suck if you kill yourself because you want out? Like I almost did so many times in my early life. And then you end up getting rid of the body, but that karma that, you know, some level of consciousness comes and the, it comes with you into the next experience. And it's not as big of a relief as you were hoping for. I think for me, the more I studied Buddhism, the more I started to kind of realize like, oh shit, suicide might not be much of a relief at all. Which, uh, but uh, you know, I wanna also pause and say, I really don't fucking know, right? I don't wanna be like pushing, you know, I really don't know what happens about after death. Um, I like Buddhism. Buddhism teaches rebirth, that there's a karma that continues. Makes enough sense to me to say, well, I'll, I'll be agnostic about that. I'll, I'll be maybe about that. I'm not one of those uh, Buddhists that's like, this is what happens for sure, because I have more of an attitude of like, we'll see. Makes some sense to me. I've always sort of reflected on some of these teachings around death and reincarnation um, of like, if Buddhism is A to Z, A through Z, and mindfulness and loving kindness and compassion and forgiveness and the core of what we're doing in refuge recovery, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, those are like the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P's of Buddhism, the first, you know, core half, the, and Reincarnation is like X, Y, Z. So for me, I'm over here going, the Buddha wasn't wrong about the transformative effects of mindfulness. Wasn't wrong about the ability to develop compassion. Wasn't wrong about forgiveness and loving kindness and suffering and the cause of suffering and the end. Wasn't wrong about all that shit. So, Maybe he's not wrong about reincarnation, but I don't know. I have a lot of verified faith in the first three quarters of the Buddha's teachings. <laughs> you know what I mean? The end part, I'm like, well, we'll see. Let's see what happens when we croak. So open for your questions, comments. If you want to share your experience with the death the meditation and the reflections, um, open to hearing about that too. If you'd like to interact, you can raise your hand in the, um, with the reactions tab at the bottom. There's that little raise hand thing, and then I'll call on you. Um, and you'll be, you, this is being recorded. So you'll be part of the YouTube, I think, though, I think we take your face out of it, but your voice will be on there. Billy, you can unmute yourself. Right on. Thanks. So, um, beginning of meditation, but I've done this one. I like the death meditation. I'm with you on that. Yeah, around around that stuff. Um, the uh, you're telling me about like teachings that like put it on this. Been one that. <laughs> and like Billy, uh, we're Billy, you're kind of cutting out, so we're not hearing all of your. Yeah. I'm not. Is every is anybody else? Are you guys all? Yeah, he's kind of in and out. So 
so we can't fully hear um, what's being said. Maybe, I don't know if you turn off your camera, sometimes the audio is better. Try that. Yep, that's it. All right, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to fully comprehend what you were saying. You could type it into the chat if you wanted to, and I could read it to the group. Um, Larry, go ahead and unmute. Hey, y'all, and uh, thanks for the meditation. Yeah, I love it. Just helps put things in perspective and brightens and lightens the day, you know, that I, that I have to live. But on uh, reincarnation, I just want to, you know, bring in another voice. You've probably read Stephen Batchelor, um, The Buddhism Without Beliefs, which, yeah, in which he says that in his studies, that, uh, you know, reincarnation was part of the culture that Buddha was born into. And, uh, and he thought that reincarnation was a distraction from what he was trying to say but he incorporated it or sided with it um, as a vehicle to uh, move forward his, what he was trying to get at that, um, which is very powerful. And um, we do know <laughs> that it works rather than reincarnation. Eh, maybe, maybe not big agnostic about it. Sure. Anyway, just want to share that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I've been very influenced by those books, the Buddhism Without Beliefs and the um, Confessions of a Buddhist Atheist. Um, but I, I think I, I land a little bit more, um, uh, you know, yeah, agnostic, like doesn't matter. The, the, what matters for us, ex maybe especially for us, since we're not interested in Buddhism as some sort of like academic exercise, but we're trying to save our own lives here in recovery, um, is that like that, that, that stuff doesn't matter as much. What matters is what we're doing. Forgiveness feels way more important. Compassion feels way more important. Mindfulness, being able to uh, maintain abstinence, that's the work that we're doing here. Um, Oren, please, love to hear from you. You can unmute. I'm Oren, a very happy Buddhist. I've been a Buddhist for 30 years. I have 43 years of AA recovery. And I want to thank you very, very much for writing the book. It was given to me by a friend and uh, your book. And you did an excellent job. And I want to commend you for your service to the entire re recovery community. I love the way you write and the instructions are clear and it's a little different path than I'm used to, but I'm happy to be going down it. And it really is good. I go to a meeting every day and using something out of the book and it really has helped me tremendously. So I thank you very, very, very much for your service, loving service to all of the recovering community. Thank you very much for your work. You are a genius, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Oren. Love, love, love having you here. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for all you've done for us, including this talk. Thank you. Okay, I'm lowering my hand. <laughs> uh, EJ, go ahead. Hello, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm EJ. Um, I'm very new to the Buddhism community, but I've always kind of wanted to study it. Um, so I hope I'm not wasting your time here because this is such a beginner-esque kind of question. But um, I was wondering if you had any advice on... Uh, like any one to two minute or like five minute exercises on just um, getting better at just kind of accepting what is. Um, Cause I've had a chronic illness for 12 years and I've always had a hard time just kind of accepting what my reality is and how to get through it. Um, 
And yeah, I was just wondering if you had any advice on just like beginner level, just like kind of acceptance exercises. Mm -hmm. um, have you been coming to some refuge meetings? No, I'm actually, I'm part of Skyline Recovery. Uh, okay, treatment um, center. Yeah, so this is my first time, this is my first refuge meeting ever. Okay, um, well, welcome. Um, thank you. Refuge, so uh, as I said at the beginning, this isn't really a refuge meeting. Um, refuge meetings are peer led. And in a refuge meeting, when you start coming, uh, every meeting there'll be a guided meditation, L like the one that I did, but guided by the peers. You, you might at some point, EJ, probably at some point if you come, you'll be asked to lead the meditation. And it's all peer led. And all of the meditations, because, uh, you know, reflecting, I hear your question about acceptance. Um, I feel like mindfulness is our, you know, we have kind of, we can break our meditation practices down into two categories, mindfulness-based meditation practices, and then uh, heart-based, uh, concentration and heart-based practices. Both the mindfulness itself, mindfulness of the breath, mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of your thoughts and your feelings are, as you turn towards them, it's going to lead to more acceptance of this is the way my mind is, this is the way my body is, this is the impermanent, impersonal, unsatisfactory nature of everything. Mindfulness is gonna to lead to more acceptance of, of the truth. Loving kindness and compassion and forgiveness and appreciation and equanimity and our other practices are also gonna to lead to more and more self-acceptance, more and more, uh, Loving kindness, for instance, we say to ourselves over and over, may I be at ease? May I be happy? May I be free from suffering? The more you start saying that to yourself, which the ultimate goal in order to be at ease, we have to accept ourselves as we are, the chronic illness, the addiction, the whatever's going on with us. So what we're doing in Refuge Recovery is a very practical way through your own efforts to come into a place of self-acceptance. And self-acceptance is going to take effort. The meditation, the showing up to meetings, the inventories, the uh, service that we do, it's all gonna take effort. But this is where Buddhism is a bit different than some of the 12-step perspectives, where what refuge recovery, what Buddhism is saying is that uh, through your own effort, you can, come, you can do this work. And you can transform and you can recover and you can heal and you can awaken and you can accept yourself and reality the way that it is, which is different than uh, needing a divine intervention and the sort of perspective that uh, other recovery perspectives that would say only a higher power is going to do that for you. Uh, Buddhism is very clear that uh, we are a humanist psychology that understands how the human mind and heart works and how we can transform based on our own actions and our own efforts and not some sort of external uh, grace or, or intervention. So welcome uh, to Refuge EJ and go to lots of meetings and meet lots of people and do the meditations. And the more you do that, the more you're going to see, oh, I'm starting to accept more and reject less and accept more and reject less and accept more and reject less. And um, I hope that that's your experience. I believe it will be. Thank you. Yeah. Billy, you think you got better internet? Go for it. I don't know. We'll see. I shut <laughs> it down and we, we did it. And then I missed a joke because you guys were laughing when I came back in. So I'm, I'm bombed about that. No, I just, I th well, thank you for the meditation. I love the death meditation. Um, I love uh, what I was trying to start to say before, which might be kind of like regressing back in the discussion. Uh, I apologize if it is. Um, just that idea of setting these things up on the shelf. And, you know, I don't really know what I think about reincarnation. Um, and, but I don't need to, I don't need to spend my effort and energy like, up in arms around it, you know, like, or trying to negate it or disprove it or any of that kind of stuff. I just kind of set it over here and I focus in on, uh, 
the 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 four truths and the noble eightfold path and um yeah i just the the last six months have been uh, a real lesson in 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 permanence and in all of those aspects of like the body breaking down like going through cancer treatment and all that kind of stuff has been really brutal um but what has been a huge help to me is this like the sangha you know the 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 people this community and i'm really appreciative of it um i uh i read your books long ago tried to start a meeting back in like 15 didn't work and then came around to it this this past year in november and have found like my jam as they would say you know um all these people there's many of them here in the meeting right now that are i, I consider to be close friends now and EJ, just to cross talk a little bit, I'd say if you've been dealing with a chronic illness for 12 years, you're you're maybe beyond the beginning stage of uh, of dealing with stuff. But uh, like Noah said, um, this here, this sangha that we have, the the work in it, the you know our dharma, you know our connection to our Buddha nature, these are the the keys for me, and super glad to be here. Anyway, that's all I got to share. Thanks, Billy. Good to see you. Yeah, you too, my friend. Christopher. Oh, hiya. So I'm I'm curious about understanding karma in this in this in this recovery mode. Like, I mean, why do I care about karma if there's no reincarnation? Not that I care about reincarnation either. Like, I mean, I thought you just beautifully said that was a beautiful, beautifully put, very Buddhist. You know, don't know. Like yeah. maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Don't know. But um, but me and I don't think I understand karma too much. I think I have this sort of Judeo-Christian point system in my head, and so I kind of want to understand karma, why it's important in my recovery. What is it? What? How is? It, how does it shape my? How? You know what I mean? Uh huh. Let me see if I just can... curious to yeah. so you hear your thoughts on it. Not yeah. Not. Well. Um... It is talked about quite a bit in the book and the first chapter and the first factor of um, uh, of the path, understanding cause and effect and karma and how it, uh, but let me see if I can talk about it in a concise way. Sort of the feeling that I have about it is um, it's so important because if I do actions that create suffering for me, I'm not going to stay sober. If I, you know, like good karma as relapse prevention, <laughs> you know, like one of the reasons why it's important is because if we continue to lie and steal and cheat and cause harm, the outcome of that, the, the pain that we're creating, the, the karma, which is the effect of negative actions, it's going to make it so hard to maintain abstinence. It's going to make, a, you know, the guilt, the regret, the, you know, because we are sensitive, we are ethical beings. And when we're unethical, it hurts us. And when we're hurting, we want to get loaded. <laughs> so, you know, whether, whatever your addiction manifests as, you know, you want to act out, you want to avoid so the importance of, hey, I don't want to create extra difficulty for me. I don't want that regret. I don't want that guilt. I don't want that. I don't want the temporary pleasure of stealing or of lying or whatever it is, because I don't want the outcome. Because karma is the understanding that we don't get away with it. We own it. And in order to recover, we're going to have to be more and more ethical and more and more careful to protect this um, process of recovery, protect our karma. Um, I don't think that I think it's much bigger than that, but that's one of the reflections that comes. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, that's a really good way. I think one of the things too I'm trying to understand is like how. Uh, 
this this good behavior which generates sort of good feelings and a good life uh, keeps me sober i mean i can understand if i'm suffering then i want to get loaded that's something but i see a lot of people who are acting like jerks in recovery True. who are you know who are staying sober too yeah but but anyway the way that you've articulated it sort of just as a karma the immediacy of karma yeah i think that makes a lot of sense to me i i mean of course you know it's yeah we can get into future karma and past karma and i tend to think of it mostly as like let's let go of this idea that karma is like what happens to us and let's reframe it mostly as how we respond to what happens is our karma not what happens like, oh, that happened to me. That must've been my karma. My karma was how I responded. Something unpleasant happened. And did I meet it with hatred or did I meet it with compassion? Did I meet it with forgiveness or did I meet it with resentment? My karma is how I'm responding, action and reaction. How are we responding to what's happening? Because that's really the momentum that we're driving forward in our life. I hope that makes sense. Anyways, John, Paul, go ahead. And we'll actually, this will be the last one. We'll, we'll end with John Paul. Hi, all. No, thank you for the meditation. Uh, that's actually the first time I've done one for death or mortality. So it was, it was interesting to, to kind of have that context, to have that, that point of view, uh, you know, uh, we all kind of hit our lows in our addiction and, you know, it's sometimes there's those ideologies of, of, of death uh, as being the solution. And it kind of just made me more appreciative of, of life. You know, I, I've uh, had a recent relapse and, and, you know, I've been kind of struggling to fight my way to the, the point of happiness to come out of the, the, the guilt and the, the obsession of, of, of self and, uh, those kind of, those kind of lows. So, you know, to, to know that the uh, hope and the optimism are the, the better ways to, to focus, uh, and the better way of life, uh, ahead is, is the, is the goal is the achievement, you know, is, uh, is, is great to kind of have a, a different perspective in, in meditation, you know, uh, I'm getting back more into meditation and, uh, you know, participate in refuge here in San Francisco. And so I get to, to go weekly and, uh, you know, we do uh, a lot of, you know, gratitude and forgiveness meditation and that sort of thing, but never, never into, uh, into the other worldly aspect of it. So, uh, I appreciate you, you putting that together tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I said at the beginning, it's in the book, but then I didn't really make a script for it. And just last year, we did get a script for it. Um, and it's a little bit short. And um, But it's an important part. Of, I think it's a central part of understanding impermanence and breaking our, like you said, that self-obsession of like, I'm not even this really this body. What's going on here is so much bigger than this physical form. So, you know, this this all is impermanent. Yeah, totally agreed. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. Um, I did say that he was going to be the last one, uh, but I do see hands from Chris and Tracy. Um, I'll try to do, be, take it brief. I think, Chris, you were first. Last two. Nobody else raised their hand because I'm codependent. I need to call on you if you ain't raise your hand. I'm not really codependent, by the way, I don't think. Chris, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, this is my first meeting. I've listened to all of your, most of the YouTube recordings for this meeting, as well as uh, read the book. Um, and I'm also in that other 12 step program, but this is my first meeting and I couldn't even believe it. I had to share this, that <clears throat> literally right before hopping on, I was, <laughs> I was Googling, um, is there a, a kind of OCD that has to do with death. Um, Cause I can't remember the phrase, but there's these different types of OCD. And lately, because my parents are aging, there's near brushes with death all the time. I'm in the hospital with them, you know, seeing people almost dead. Um, and it really, um, I feel like it really has affected, here, I'll put my, uh, my, 
it was starting to kind of affect my sobriety. And um, I started feeling like I started feeling like maybe I was going to drink over this. <laughs> and it sounds ridiculous, but I was like, I keep thinking about death. I keep thinking about not me dying so much as just looking at all these people and thinking they were going to die. And uh, my mom had a scan uh, for a, a swallowing issue. So I saw straight through, I was in there in the radiology. I literally saw straight through her head. I just saw her skull and her spine and she was wearing glasses and you could see the glasses. Um, and it just made me realize like, yeah, what, what are we? It's that existential kind of OCD too. You know, just we're walking around with this flesh and we've got our souls. So when you said, oh, we're doing the corpse meditation, I almost turned it off. I almost was like, no, this is my biggest fear. But I was just reading about OCD and how exposure therapy is one of the ways that they treat it. And I thought, oh my God, this is a sign from the universe. Like I'm supposed to be here. And I went through that whole meditation with you and even the maggots. And I'm like, what is he talking about? But <laughs> I was like, oh my God, maggots are eating my body all the way through the end. I stayed with you. I stayed with you all the way. And I really did feel like I was reborn. I felt like that was the very best thing I, I could have done because I've been obsessing over like for two days, at least obsessing over death um, and, and these people dying. Cause I see it every single day. So anyway, I absolutely love this and I will for sure be perusing uh, the meetings and finding some more. So I'm Chris, I'm in uh, San Francisco, California. And thank you so much for the corpse meditation. <laughs> You're welcome, Chris. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Glad you were here. And absolutely, exposure therapy, mm -hmm, mindfulness, mm -hmm. is, that's exactly what we're doing. It was amazing. I just made that huge connection. I mean, yeah, I couldn't believe it. And Five you minutes know, before. Make, yeah. friend, make friends with death is the goal. Total acceptance and friendliness towards the, the reality that we live in rather than, rather than avoiding it or denying it. Yeah, I literally feel like I have a whole new attitude in 20 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever that was. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Tracy, you get the last word. Wow. I'm honored. Um, <laughs> I'll keep it really brief. <laughs> I'll keep it super brief, but I do want to say that I, um, I'm new, not new to refuge, but I've just jumped into like fully jumped into recovery and this community in the last two weeks. And it's been amazing. You have been, however, a teacher of mine since uh, I think I was there at Barnes and Noble, like when your first book came out. And so you have been a teacher for a long time and it's good to be live with you. Um, but I just wanted to quickly say, if you can remember exactly what you said at the end of that meditation, I want to write it down how you said it, that really something along the lines of all that we are, are our actions. I don't remember. Oh, you. oh the, five, the five daily reflections. You can Google Buddhists five daily remembrances or reflections and some version of what I said will come up. Okay, all right. Sickness, aging, death, loss, and all we truly own are our actions. And, it, and I said something like, um, we're born of our karma, we're the heirs to our karma, we inherit our, our actions. Uh, and that's a kind of traditional phrase on some level in Buddhism. So I you might find something like that. The thing about this is different traditions translate things different. So you'll find some bastardization of that or another somewhere out there. And, um, or my mind was a bastardization either way. <laughs> and nice to see you, you know, Dharma punks, if we were at Barnes and Noble, that was 19 years ago. You have been a teacher for a very long time. Yeah, we're, com we're coming up on 20 yeah. years of that book. Yeah. 20, 20 years ago. Yeah. So nice, nice, to, nice to see you. you. And yeah, and welcome to the Sangha, to this this incarnation of the, the recovery sangha and it's growing and it's, where are you, Tracy? Atlanta, Georgia. In Atlanta. There, I think there are a couple of meetings. There was a whole bunch of meetings. We lost some of the meetings down there, um, but there are people in your areas. I don't know if Summer's here tonight, but there's a bunch of people that I know. We, I have connected with Summer. Okay, yeah. good, good. Uh, yeah. So you're get you know, get plug in with, 
with the people down there and um nice to see you again yeah thank you okay i'm gonna leave it there for tonight thank you all for showing up welcome to um to this uh, you know i do the first thursday every month and um talked about death this month maybe we'll talk about sex next month and keep it interesting and um i'll see you see you then i noticed that michelle thank you for helping um with the door and she put in a link to the corpse meditation script from the website and also a link to donations uh i'm not being paid to do this i do this as my service any donations you give won't be coming to me. They'll just be going to the nonprofit. Please give donations to the nonprofit. I actually um, tend to most of the, the stuff in the nonprofit and um, notice that actually do donations seem to be down a bit. Uh, maybe it's because not so many people are going to the online meetings and donating that way. They're donating at meetings and paying rent. Um, but it's very supportive. We have, you know, overhead and rent and salaries and all of that stuff. So uh, if you can be generous to Refuge Recovery World Services, please do. It's very gratefully uh, accepted and appreciated. And so there's a link there for donations if you'd like to donate. Um, and I would announce the, the here's, here's what we can announce. There's still room and still time to come to the Refuge Recovery annual conference it's a camp out this year it's you know it's in um, big bear which is the mountains of southern california a couple hours outside of los angeles um, it's residential so you can either camp or stay in a cabin uh, friday saturday sunday june 10th 11th and 12th and that's sort of unlimited and people can come and, and connect at, in person and we'll have meetings and we'll have some fun and we'll have some you know, conflict, I'm sure, as you get a bunch of addicts together, there'll be some conflict and then you can forgive each other. It's great. You know, it's amazing. I hope you hope you come. And, um, and then there's a seven day retreat in November that registration is open for. All of this is on the website. Come look at the refugerecovery.org website. Most of you are here because you went through that website. So you know where you know where to look. May any goodness that comes from our practice be gathered and offered outward in all directions. May each of us recover, may each of us heal, may each of us awaken. And together may we uh, create a positive change on this planet, helping all of the addicts who are seeking help that we can and um, sharing the merit and the blessings of our lives. Thank you, good to see everybody and uh, See you next month, perhaps. Thank you, Noah. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. Be well.